Hello, everyone. My name is Danielle Smaha, and I am Manomet's Director of Marketing and Communications. Thank you so much for joining us today to learn more about the shorebirds of Louisiana and the habitat they need to thrive. I'm pleased to have with me today Manomet's Karis Rittenauer, a conservation biologist focused on increasing the pace and scale of shorebird friendly habitat management in Louisiana. Karis is joined by Jason Olzak, wetland bird specialist for the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. Working out of Lafayette, Jason's work includes numerous monitoring and wetland habitat management projects on both private and public lands. If you're new to Manomet, we are a nonprofit focused on empowering stakeholders through science. Since Manomet's beginnings in 1969, our work has branched out far beyond our Plymouth, Massachusetts based bird banding operation. Over the past 50 years, our science and research have expanded to focus on ecosystem management and resilience, shorebird conservation, and educating tomorrow's leaders about the importance of the natural world. Diversity, science, and climate change are the fundamental principles driving Manomet's work today. I have just a couple quick things to share with you before turning things over to our panel. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see a box marked Q&A. If you don't see it, please use your mouse pointer to hover over the bottom and it should appear. If at any point during the presentation you have a question, feel free to, quick, to click on that Q&A box to enter it. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of today's presentation. Finally, if you're unable to stay for the entirety of today's presentation, it is being recorded. We will send you a follow-up email with a link to the recording in the next day or so. Thank you again for joining us. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Karis and Jason. Hold on one second, we seem to be having an issue. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Danielle. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, if you're not from Louisiana, I expect that if you if you were imagining a Louisiana landscape, you might think of something like this. If you're thinking a little bit more naturalistically, you might be picturing something that looks more like this. But I think it's unlikely that an image that would first come to your mind is something that looks like this. And so today, Jason and I want to introduce you to the shorebird species and the wonderful and varied habitat within Louisiana that they use to not only migrate, but breed and uh, spend the winter here. Before that, a little bit about Manomet and our shorebird work and why shorebirds are so important. Shorebird populations are in decline uh, and that is especially true for long distance migrants. Studies have shown that more than, uh, that, that of the 19 long distance shorebird species uh, more, uh, have declined in their population more than 50% in the last 40 years. So Benamet works throughout the Americas to conserve shorebird habitat and to encourage shorebird conservation. We do that through three main avenues, uh, science and conducting research to understand these birds and their habitat needs better. Uh, site conservation, working with the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network or WIZERN to protect the sites that are most important to imperiled shorebird species. And habitat management, working on the ground to improve and expand shorebird habitat. And we do this all by partnering with other organizations, government agencies, and communities and individuals on the ground everywhere we work. The Western Hemisphere is divided into three main flyways for shorebirds, the Pacific Flyway, Atlantic Flyway, and the Mid-Continent. Most people, when they think of shorebirds, think of the beach, and so would be more likely to think about uh, shorebirds migrating through 
uh, on one of the coasts. But the mid-continent is also an incredibly fascinating and diverse area for shorebirds. And there are many species that are just as fascinating as those that migrate on either coast. Uh, Manomet has played a key role in developing uh, shorebird conservation plans for both the Atlantic and Pacific Flyway. And the Mid-Continent Shorebird Conservation Initiative is currently underway. And Manomet is uh, helping to ensure the future conservation of the mid-continent. Manomet already has a presence in many parts of the mid-continent. Um, our Arctic work in uh, Northern Alaska, where you see that star, uh, with breeding birds, uh, long distance migrants who breed in the far North Arctic, uh, include buff-breasted sandpipers, which you see there with some very cute chicks, and American golden plovers, as well as many others. But we're just going to take a look at these two for right now. Um, in a normal year, <laughs> uh, Man and Met staff uh, working together with other partners would be up in the Arctic uh, fairly soon this spring, um, and uh, performing species surveys, deploying nest cameras, uh, to look at nest survival and depredation, as well as deploying GPS tags. Uh, it's a little difficult to see uh, as the GPS tag is very small, uh, but on that American golden plover that uh, Shiloh is releasing in that photo, there is a little GPS backpack, which is going to help researchers track its movements throughout the breeding grounds, uh, help us better understand what habitats it's using, as well as tracking their movements on migration. And so speaking of migration, I keep mentioning long distance migrants. Uh, these birds fly all the way from the far Arctic to Southern South America. As you see that new blue star down there is Laguna de Rocha in Uruguay. It is a withering site as well as part of our uh, uh, part of our coalition's uh, initiative uh, with Manomet and Wizard. And uh, these these little shorebirds fly over 8,000 miles twice a year from uh, their breeding grounds to their wintering grounds. And remember that they don't soar, so they are flapping that entire way. Uh, and Manomet and Wizard are working at their wintering sites as well, conducting research and working with ranchers to manage and maintain their wintering habitat, which for these two species in particular is mostly uh, short grass, open fields, uh, and primarily uh, right now they're using cattle pastures. And you can see that this buff-breasted sandpiper has some tags and has probably been tracked at many locations along its migration route. And so Louisiana is an incredibly important stopover site for species like this. Uh, we're located just about halfway along that 8,000 mile round trip. Um, and uh, importantly, depending on the shorebird migratory strategy, we may, uh, Louisiana could be the last stop on their migration southward before making a big jump across the open ocean of the Gulf of Mexico for hundreds of miles. Similarly, in spring migration, as they're coming back up to their breeding grounds, it is the first stop within North America uh, where, they need, where many shorebirds rest and refuel after making that, that big flight. So ensuring that these birds have areas to rest and recuperate uh, and fatten themselves up along this journey is just as important as making sure that they have safe places to breed as well as to spend their winters and can have just as much of uh, an impact on the species survival. Another way that Manomet is working in the mid-continent is with our wimbrel studies. Uh, it's 
Some of you might be familiar with Manomet's work and you might have seen Alan Nidal's webinar last month. Uh, if not, you should check it out on the Manomet website because it's really fascinating. But uh, Alan and others have been working on tracking Wimbrel on their migrations and identifying important resource areas for them along the east coast of North America. And starting this spring, we will begin conducting on the ground research and working with partners and volunteers to determine where Wimbrel roosts in Louisiana. So uh, the lines on the map you can see here are an approximate flight path of one Wimbrel. Uh, his name is Conway, and he's currently in his fifth year after being tagged by our partners at the Center for Conservation Biology. He was tagged in Canada, um, and as you can see, birds don't necessarily follow <clears throat> the um, the boundaries we set up for them. He crosses the boundaries between the Atlantic and the Mid-Continent Flyway, but he does stop in Louisiana. Interestingly, though, any visitor in the spring uh, could see Wimbrel uh, feasting on the agricultural fields and in other habitats across Louisiana. We don't currently know exactly where they spend their nights. Uh, Wimbrel usually roost in large flocks together for safety, and there is one known roost site in Texas, and while we know that they must be utilizing somewhere in Louisiana, uh, that is something that we are hoping to find out uh, by working down here with these tagged Wimbrels as also on the ground, as well as on the ground with partners and volunteers uh, in order to better safeguard this species. And so Louisiana is crucial for migratory shorebirds and visited by almost 40 shorebird species annually, but not all shorebirds migrate through. Some uh, species do use Louisiana as nesting grounds and others, uh, short distance migrants would spend their winters here. Just as a comparison, uh, in the waterfowl world, a long distance migrant is one that migrates from the Arctic uh, and the far edge, the far north of Alaska or Canada and spends their winter here in Louisiana. Uh, but for a long distance shorebird like the breast breasted sandpiper, that's only half their journey. Uh, for comparison, snow geese uh, are one of one such long distance migrant of shorebirds. Uh, they weigh about six pounds and buff-breasted sandpipers weigh about 2.2 ounces or roughly 2% of a goose's body size and travel twice as far, twice a year. Um, shorebirds are really fascinating species and they really do connect us through an amazing, uh, an amazing flight that they take every, uh, every year. Um, the entire Gulf Coast from, or the Western Gulf Coast from Texas to Alabama hosts uh, approximately 4.8 million migratory breeding and wintering shorebirds. Louisiana is only a small part of that, but together with our portion of the Gulf Coast, as well as the birds that primarily use the Mississippi Alluvial Valley or farther north in Louisiana, uh, it is estimated that Louisiana hosts approximately a million shorebirds every year. In addition to having an important place along the, along the migration path in terms of proximity to the Gulf, Louisiana is also crucial for shorebirds because much of the interior of the United States and Canada is dry or drying, especially uh, with climate change. And Louisiana reliably has wetlands. It's a very wet state and there's always somewhere for the birds to go. Um, and so safeguarding this habitat for their stopover sites is going to be very important, uh, both now and in the future. And so before I turn it over to Jason, um, I've been talking a lot about conserving shorebird habitat, and I think it's worth exploring just for a minute what shorebird habitat means. Um, so these birds are looking for open habitat. They do not enjoy being under trees or woody vegetation or uh, tall grasses or anything like that. Uh, similarly, they like minimal vegetation 
primarily open water or mudflats, um, shallow flooding, anything from a saturated sand or mudflat to approximately six inches uh, deep in water, depending on the shorebird species. Uh, some of them have longer legs or longer bills that help them probe more deeply in higher water. Uh, and some of them are much smaller, like these shown here. They like very little disturbance. Um, a perfect pristine beach is not going to be much use to a shorebird if it's full of dogs running loose and uh, tourists uh, sunbathing. Um, and then, of course, they want abundant invertebrates which is the primary food of most of these shorebird species that they need to stock up on along their migration route. So with that, I will turn it over to Jason, who's gonna tell you a little bit more about the specific species and the habitats that they use within the state of Louisiana. Thank you, Karis. Um, so what I wanna do then is uh, start out by um, introducing a lot of the, the, the species, the habitats, and some of the conservation challenges that we face for shorebirds, or for managing shorebirds in Louisiana. Um, and I also initially want to introduce a few, few terms or, or regions that I'll be talking about uh, quite often in this presentation. Um, looking at the map there, uh, when I refer to the Mississippi Alluvial Valley, uh, that's that uh, label number one in the map, and that's that floodplain of the Mississippi River along the eastern edge. Um, uh, very fertile soil that was um, dominated historically by bottomland hardwoods. Um, also of, of importance to shorebirds is that Gulf Coast area. So you've got uh, label three, the coastal marsh. You've got the um, uh, label two, the um, hardwood swamp area, uh, south central Louisiana, and also the, the Cajun prairie or that historic long um, uh, tall grass prairie uh, labeled number nine there in uh, southwest Louisiana. Um, <clears throat> so many, many changes have taken place uh, with the dominant ecological communities uh, within Louisiana. A and though these, these overall communities have changed, sometimes drastically, uh, the regions of high shorebird use have not. Um, so historically, shorebird use was, was dominated by birds along the, that, that coastal region, the beaches, coastal marsh, um, barrier islands in Louisiana. Uh, but also there was a, a good bit of use um, along that Mississippi Valley uh, on the sandbars, river scours, and oxbows um, along the river valley there in a, in a forest dominated landscape. Um, and then also at that, in that Cajun Prairie area, uh, shorebird use was along the wetland margins and, and likely in areas that had, had burned. Um, go ahead and switch the slide there, Karis. So yeah, there's been a lot of habitat loss, but there, with that comes some, some new opportunities. Um, uh, coastal wetlands, as, as probably a lot of people have heard or, or read about, um, coastal wetlands are being lost at a, at a pretty rapid rate in Louisiana. Uh, in the last 80 years, we've lost 2,000 square miles to a variety, for a variety of reasons, erosion, uh, subsidence, channelization, saltwater intrusion, all contribute to loss of of, uh, of coastal marsh habitat, um, including barrier islands and beaches. Um, and just really quickly to some of the restoration and protection techniques that, that, that we employ include river diversion, um, getting that sediment back out to, to rebuild marsh um, from, a, from a channelized river, um, strategic displacement of dredge spoil. Um, the, the rivers are still dredged. It's just a question of where are you going to put that sediment once you, you've dug it out of the, the river channels for, for transportation. Uh, terracing is another one. Uh, and, then, and then construction of breakwaters um, to, to, to protect uh, shoreline from, from wave erosion. Um, now moving up to, to the Cajun Prairie and the Mississippi Louisville Valley. Um, so again, that was, that was historically dominated by, by forests. Um, it, in the MAV specifically, 75% uh, of that forest had been removed in the last 100 years. Um, this, this is, you know, it's alluvial soil, it's very fertile. Um, the thought was that's gonna make some great uh, agricultural land. Uh, soybeans, cotton, corn, and rice uh, were the predominant um, uh, crops grown there. 
However, it is still it's still flood prone. So, so there's a lot of uh, opportunities lost as far as agriculture goes uh, in the MAV. Um, and then the Cajun Prairie too, less than 1% of that tall grass prairie remains. Um, most of that was converted to rice, crawfish, and as well to a growing extent, sugar cane uh, is dominant in that landscape. Um, so management of these, these converted agriculture lands inland in Louisiana has a huge potential to benefit shorebirds. Next. <clears throat> so yeah, overall, historically, there's been 45 species documented uh, by the Louisiana Ornithological Society. Now that's including a lot of accidentals or, or even extinct, like Eskimo curlew is on that list uh, as well. So that's just the, the historic uh, uh, number of birds. But more generally, uh, as Kara said, it's somewhere between 35, 40 species uh, annually in Louisiana. Um, two major habitat joint ventures, which are partnerships, federal, state, non-governmental non organizations, um, that, that lead the way in conservation planning for shorebirds in Louisiana are the Gulf Coast Joint Venture and the Lower Mississippi Valley Joint Venture. Um, both of these use uh, bioenergetic models um, in, in planning for shorebird conservation. So that takes into account, you know, populations. How many birds do we expect to be using landscapes in Louisiana? Um, bird energy requirements uh, in the form of invertebrates. Um, uh, what is the energy content of, of those prey items, and then the prey density within the habitat that we have. So that the, the concept that you'll hear about a little bit later, you know, the, the concept of habitat deficit, that, that is coming from, from these calculations. Um, both, both joint ventures share a lot of the same species. However, the, obviously the Gulf Coast region is going to have some more of those beach type specialist uh, birds. Um, and then a lot of the birds that pass through the MAV will end up either passing on through in migration uh, the Gulf Coast area or, or a lot of them will winter there as well. Um, uh, the Gulf Coast Joint Venture uses eight uh, or plans for eight focal species and th they're actually the we're planning habitat for all species but these th these list of eight species here have a uh, a very diverse or, or broad array of habitats. So you've got some of the upland type species like buff presseds and long builds, the beach species like Wilson's and snowy plover. Um, you know, you're, you're by managing or, or conserving habitat for Wilson's and snowy plover, you're also going to be conserving for red knots and uh, piping plovers as well. So, so these are just the representatives of different habitat types uh, that you'll find on the Gulf Coast. And in the lower Mississippi Valley, um, the habitat serves as an important migratory corridor for a, a what I've got listed here, 12 of the greatest conservation concern um, of species uh, using that area. Uh, and it, highlighted in green there, those are the six species in the Mississippi Alluvial Valley that would typically make up about 75% of total shorebird counts. Um, many of, of, of surveys or, or the, the literature that uh, uh, concerning populations in the MAV will follow that pattern too of, of those six species being making up the bulk of shorebirds uh, in the using habitats in the MAV. Next. And so breeders too, really quick. Uh, obviously we have the, the obligate breeders on the Gulf Coast, the snowy plover, Wilson's plover, and uh, American oyster catcher, that one's more, um, it, it's not very common in Louisiana and, and where it is, is, is more toward the southeast tip um, uh, island uh, areas in, of, of Louisiana. Um, interior in the, in the MAV and the Cajun Prairie area, you'd find, you know, obviously the cosmopolitan killdeer, um, black neck stilts, those are the two most common and then not very many, but we do have some willet and spotted sandpiper uh, that nests in Louisiana as well. Next. So an important part of, of planning for migratory species is, is knowing the phenology or when these birds are present in your area. Um, Louisiana, 
our, our wintering period is from November to February. Um, and they use both coastal and inland um, areas, uh, habitats, um, even up in through the uh, Mississippi Valley, um, depending on, on weather, cold snaps may force them down to the coast, but um, there are some species that spend the whole winter in, in the MAB. Um, spring habitat um, or spring migration takes place from February to May. That peak is in April. Um, and habitat at that time of year in Louisiana is typically plentiful. There, there's a lot of uh, managed waterfowl impoundments that are being drained at that time. Um, duck hunting heritage is, is very big in, in Louisiana. So there's a lot of, lot of acres that are, have served their purpose for, for waterfowl and those are, those are let out in the spring. Uh, as well, rice planting that's done over uh, shallow water. Um, so, so that provides a lot of habitat. And this is the time where there's, there's low vegetation density. Not, the vegetation hasn't really grown and flourished um, like it will later uh, in Louisiana. So, so habitat's not really a limiting factor for, for shorebirds in the spring. Um, by June and July, uh, really it's only the resident species that we have left, black neck stilts, the beach nesting, um, snowy plovers, Wilson's plover, uh, and, and then obviously killdeer too. Um, uh, a lot of those still left through the summer. Autumn, however, is the time of habitat deficit in the interior portions of the state. Um, many, many of the impoundments and agricultural fields are dense with vegetation by that time. They've had all summer to grow. It's, it's robust vegetation. Um, and if the water's held later and then let off, uh, if it's let off too quickly, um, you'll end up with that cracked earth because uh, there's a high evaporative rate. A lot of that, that shallow water in August, it, I mean, it's hotter than bath water. It, it doesn't persist on the landscape very long. It evaporates quickly. And so you've really got to have a handle on what you're doing to, to maintain mud flat shoreward type uh, habitats. Uh, go ahead. So now that you've, I've, I've referenced some of these habitats already that are used by shorebirds, I, I want to show a, a few graphic depictions and show a few of the species that may be found there. Um, these are representative species. You, you'll typically find many more species, but th these would be kind of more uh, 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 representatives, uh, I suppose. Um, so barrier islands, um, they're of, of major importance for the beach specialists. They are the most vulnerable to erosion. And there's annually, there's a lot of work done on maintaining them, a lot of money spent on maintaining those barrier islands. They are the protection for the rest of the coast. Um, uh, there are some, but, but, but similar mainland sandy beaches are not very common in Louisiana uh, at all. Next. So most of the beaches in Louisiana are, are, are look like the, the photo here. Um, they're at the terminal ends of the marsh. They're made up of large particle size. It's shell hash over a, a lower layer, a mud base <coughs> layer. And that's um, right there at the, at the wash zone where the waves uh, and the, tide, the tidal zone, that's where those shorebirds feed. Um, our beaches, uh, as far as disturbance goes, are, are very low disturbance. This is not a place where you want to uh, sunbathe and swim. Um, so, so disturbance is not a factor as far as shorebird, shorebirds on these typical Louisiana beaches. Like I said, we do have some of those sandy type beaches, but not very many. Um, and these beaches also have a, a substantial rack line or, or a lot of other debris washed up on them. Um, you know, to, it's a ready turned stone heaven, really, uh, as far as all that all debris for them to pick through. Next. Also, coastal marsh. So, further inland, uh, the coast, we've got many acres of, of coastal marsh of varying salinities. Uh, they provide considerable habitat. It's reliable habitat for shorebirds. Uh, from afar, you wouldn't think shorebirds are using it. It's robust emergent marsh vegetation. Um, it may uh, appear to be exclusive shorebirds. However, uh, a lot of it or good portions of it are tidally influenced. Um, whereas other areas that have mud, have mud flats that are exposed during low tides or north winds, um, also declining river levels or a combination of them all, 
can expose a lot of um, mud flats that'll be utilized by shorebirds. Next. And, and by the way, to that coastal marsh, uh, that's that's the biggest area where we're losing uh, uh, wetland habitat or, or land loss uh, along the coast is that coastal marsh zone. Um, swamp hardwood habitat as well, that's uh, concentrated kind of mostly in the south central part of, of the state, the Atchafalaya River uh, mouth, the, the basin and the mouth of the Atchafalaya River. Um, that, that can also provide habitat and that's, also, that's based on tide, wind also, and then water levels. So the Atchafalaya River rises and falls depending on how much Mississippi River water is being diverted into it. During times of high Mississippi River water, they're sending a lot down uh, the Atchafalaya. But, and then when that goes back down later on, that exposes a lot of uh, potential shorebird habitat. Next. And, and speaking of the Atchafalaya River Delta, this is a, a very good depiction of, of kind of that, that river splay where the, there's two mouths that, that empty out into the Gulf. Um, further, further north in that, it, within that picture is kind of some of that swamp hardwood. And then as you get down, um, more towards the, the fingers of the outlet of the river, uh, it's coastal marsh, and then all mudflat, all those splays, that's all mudflat and marsh creation. Um, the Atchafalaya River Delta is, is a place where naturally we're, we're actually gaining um, coastal land because of that sedimentation. Next. Other shorebird habitats include managed impoundments, and you'll find these statewide. Uh, like I mentioned before, waterfowl a large factor in, in wetland protection in uh, Louisiana. Um, you'll find these impoundments, uh, a lot of them are government owned lands, national wildlife refuges, wildlife management areas. Um, you know, those are being managed for migratory birds um, and, and other types of water birds. Um, as well, many private individuals, duck clubs, um, et cetera, they, they manage impoundments as well for, for high quality waterfowl. Um, habitat and, and um, recreational opportunities. Um, and those are managed, you know, basically by water and vegetation manipulation, um, keeping the right plants as food sources for waterfowl. Uh, and, and, and that you can be, that can be done by water manipulation and then also, you know, um, putting in tractors and, and, and taking care of problem vegetation that way. Um, as well, the Wetland Reserve Easement Program, or what was formerly known as wet, uh, WRP, it's WRE now, but um, that's been a large factor in the restoration of hydrology and wildlife habitat in the MAV, in the Mississippi Valley. Um, again, that, that they're, they're reforesting a lot of that lost bottomland hardwood, but with that goes the, the hydrology restoration. So there's a lot of impoundment construction as well. Um, since its inception, uh, almost coming up on 30 years ago, uh, Louisiana um, has protected more than 300,000 acres through WRE, uh, and that includes greater than 30,000 acres of, of shallow water impoundments that at times can be managed for, for uh, shorebirds. Um, next. So agricultural lands, again, like, like I mentioned before, this is a, a, an area of, of high potential for management for all kinds of water birds and shorebirds included. Um, recall the location uh, on, on the previous map I showed, uh, the, the MAV, it's, it's dominated by lands in the MAV and that former Cajun Prairie. Um, it's uh, naturally it's low land, winter, winter rains and river floods would, would put water on that landscape. Um, however, there, there are also a lot of those properties that have levees and water control structures that can hold water longer than a, a typical river flood would, would have, have that land inundated. Um, and then there, a lot of those are managed as well. The ability to hold water is essential for rice and crawfish. So levees and water control structures are an important part of the infrastructure on this landscape. Um, and in addition, many, many are managed for winter duck hunting um, as a form of recreation or uh, financially, um, they can lease those properties out um, for, for, for duck hunting during the winter as well. So agricultural lands play a big, big, uh, big role for water birds um, in the following winter uh, in Louisiana. Next. And finally, we have grasslands um, too, for some of those uh, upland specialists. 
uh, scattered, they're in the form of scattered pastures and sod farms. Um, and these would be, you know, typically the, the species that would have historically used those burn areas in, in Cajun Prairie or, or up the Red River Valley. Um, and they now benefit from the effects of grazing rather than burn off that excess vegetation it's being raised off or, or mowed in the case of a sod farm. Next. And as far as specific sites go, there, there are a few uh, in very important shorebird sites in Louisiana, um, like specifically other than just broad geographic regions. We do not have any Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network sites of importance, but there, I think there are some potential areas uh, and, and I'll list those here. Uh, the first one would be down there in Southwest Louisiana, the Rockefeller uh, uh, State Wildlife Refuge and the Southwest Louisiana uh, National Wildlife Refuge Complex, which includes Old Sabine, Cameron Prairie and Lacassine National Wildlife Refuges. Um, uh, and, and that includes impoundments, um, beaches, uh, coastal marsh type habitat. Um, so that that's uh, a, one of the very important sites in Louisiana. And that's one of the most accessible too. A lot of these, a lot of the places shorebirds like to, to be and feed are, you, you know, they're hard to get to, um, especially in Louisiana. Um, but, but there's a, a, an active tourism push and, and kind of bird watching uh, route through some roads that, that bisect that area. Next. Um, so yeah, the Mississippi River, bird, the Birdfoot Delta, um, and that includes Delta National Wildlife Refuge and Passaloot Wildlife Management Area. That's down there at the uh, the, the end of the Mississippi River. Uh, very hard to get to, um, so uh, but very important for for shorebirds and, and waterfowl alike. Next, as I mentioned previously, that Atchafalaya River Delta as well. That's a good boat ride to get down there, um, but those clays and mud flats produced by by that that sediment pouring out the Atchafalaya, uh, really important high, high densities and, and um, species richness uh, in, at the Atchafalaya Delta. Next. The Cajun Prairie uh, Ag Fields, again that's not a, that's not a specific site, but it, it, it is a potential uh, wishing landscape of importance um, and that's another one that's that's kind of accessible. It's a, it's a lot of ag fields bisected by roads on, on all sides, so as far as surveying, monitoring, bird watching, uh, that's a very accessible area um, um, for, for, for viewing shorebirds. Next. And then finally further up there, kind of a little bit outside of the MAV is Catahoula Lake and that's, uh, that's a 20,000 acre, basically a moist soil unit. It, it, it gets drawn down every summer from, Mac, I guess it, it's 10 feet or less uh, during the winter and then during the summer you can walk and drive trucks out on it. Um, and that that one I've, I've, I've got the most experience with. I've got uh, numerous years of survey data out there showing more than 100,000 birds using that per year. Next. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna just reiterate that, that, that in most years spring habitat is not limiting. Um, the, 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 what you see here in this picture is, is, rice feed, is a rice field with seeds germinating. This is getting later in the spring. Eventually that rice is going to get too thick for shorebird use. The, the water is going to evaporate off or, or once the rice grows up they're going to put water on it. That's the, that's the means of weed control in a rice field is flooding it up deeper than, deeper than that. Um, but by that time typically most of our, our migratory birds are gone. They've headed north and um, they're, they're gone for the summer. Uh, next. So again, I'm bringing up deficits. The, the deficits uh, as far as shorebird habitat go, are they're occurring in the fall. Uh, recall this is based on the number of birds and their di dietary requirements um, and their prey density in a given area of usable habitat. Um, also remember this is a time of high vegetation density in wetlands. A lot of those managed wetlands are, are flush with, with thick uh, vegetation. Um, and as well, the during the summer there when when harvest is happening they're they're taking water off these are uh, the ag fields are are dry um, during harvest um, and so based but remember based on that ag footprint that's there, there's a lot of uh, a lot of potential habitat in ag use right now um, 
and and the compatible land use with that compatible land use is the largest potential to address those shorebird habitat needs. Um, conversely, to waterfowl, shorebird management requires a little bit more work. You've got to is in in an agricultural setting, you've got to deal with the residue or the stubble left over after harvest, um, and 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 that phenology. Shorebirds come through a little bit earlier than waterfowl. They're kind of late summer, early fall, uh, and one way to address this in Louisiana is through that Working Lands for Wildlife program um, that Karis is involved in now. Um, that land, the, the benefits there is that that land is kept in production. Um, there's a little bit of financial incentive for the, for the landowners, but, but it's kept in production and the prep work is done by the landowners. So there's not a, a, a large investment from a lot of outside uh, organizations as far as doing the actual work. So I'm done with that with uh, what I had to say there, and I'll turn it back over to um, Karis in order to talk a little bit more about the uh, Working Lands for Wildlife Shorebirds in Louisiana. All right, thank you so much, Jason. Um, so the uh, Shorebirds of Louisiana Wetlands uh, program, as Jason said, uh, was actually born out of a Manomet hosted uh, Habitats for Shorebird, Habit Habitats for Shorebirds workshop uh, that was hosted in Mississippi in 2015. It is now a state priority for Louisiana within the federal Working Lands for Wildlife program. As Jason mentioned, this is using uh, uh, far, uh, farmland that is in production, uh, uh, land that is producing food um, and uh, can, can be used to, uh, to produce food for not just humans, but also for hungry shorebirds. Um, <clears throat> So this program provides incentives as well as technical assistance to landowners and producers to create that fall migratory habitat that is so vitally needed here in Louisiana. Um, and uh, this is primarily uh, Manomet's focus in Louisiana currently and, um, and my focus as well. Um, Manomet is doing one of the things that we do best, which is partnering with other organizations, communities, and individuals uh, on the ground to uh, perform outreach, uh, to connect with interested producers, and to work with them to plan their management practices. Uh, we're partnering with farmers and getting them the information they need uh, in order to uh, be a part of this conservation effort. Um, uh, another part of my job, in addition to uh, assisting with finding introduce, uh, interested producers and helping them uh, create this habitat is uh, monitoring the shorebird response. Um, so uh, I will be out there in the fields uh, seeing, seeing uh, counting the shorebirds as they come into to this new fall habitat. And luckily for us, shorebirds have been shown to be very responsive to habitat management and improvement. Uh, it usually, uh, um, uh, if uh, you've ever seen a crawfish field, um, the day that it uh, that it is drained and that and that shallow water habitat is available, you'll see uh, shorebirds as well as other water birds just flock to that area. And uh, the uh, the mantra with with shorebird habitat management uh, is: if you build it, they will come. So we are largely focused uh, with the Shorebirds of Louisiana Wetlands program on crawfish and rice. Uh, any agricultural land is eligible, uh, but as Jason mentioned, crawfish and rice have this uh, huge advantage of already having the infrastructure and the ability to manage wetlands similar to those managed impoundments that Jason talked about. And so yes, uh, crawfish is a crop here in Louisiana. Uh, for those of you not from the state, I'm sure uh, that's a little bit of a foreign concept. Uh, on the left here, you can see a field uh, in which that producer is uh, 
has planted rice on the top and bottom and then has a gap there in the middle. Um, those white circles on top of a, a, a larger black cage is a crawfish trap. They're uh, baited and then uh, a producer will go out in a boat just like that and uh, empty all the traps uh, periodically throughout the season in order to harvest crawfish. Um, and so uh, on the right, you can see a pure rice field, uh, just rice, no crawfish. Um, and you can see that uh, issue that Jason was talking about, about uh, when, when rice gets, uh, gets going, <laughs> it is very high and very thick and not very good for shorebirds. Uh, so in addition to uh, being able to hold water, these crops also have a pretty good timing uh, in terms of shorebirds. Um, as Jason mentioned, uh, it's fairly common practice to flood up uh, to provide habitat for waterfowl within uh, former rice fields uh, or uh, rice fields that are no longer in production uh, in, uh, in November. But most rice, um, and, it, and it differs throughout the state, there are a lot of different cropping systems depending on where in the state the crops are grown, the weather, uh, the individual land and landowner. Um, or producer, but um, rice uh, can usually be harvested in August, um, except for uh, in far southern Louisiana where there's often a return crop or a second crop where you harvest in August and then uh, you can actually, the growing season is so long that you can actually grow a second crop, um, which uh, can be a little, uh, can is, is great for food production, but uh, not, not ideal habitat for shorebirds. So uh, we're focused especially on rice in the MAV uh, farther inland where there isn't usually a return crop. And um, that rice is usually harvested in August. And then there is this, um, this window of time uh, from, from September to November uh, where there's a huge opportunity to flood those fields and uh, and allow shorebirds to come. But when I say flood, by the way, um, this, these programs do not require pumping of any kind. Um, it is simply closing water control structures so that any water that, that comes in naturally through rain uh, and other precipitation um, will stay in the field and create that, uh, that prime uh, saturated shorebird habitat. Uh, and especially through natural um, flooding and drying, cycle will we'll keep that on the, on the habitat. And so really um, <clears throat> any amount of, uh, of habitat we can get uh, to close that gap between September, uh, the end of August and November is gonna be good for shorebirds. Um, while many species uh, come through early in that July to October um, migratory uh, timeline, there are other species such as Dunlin, uh, and some and some other species who tend to migrate towards the end of that, and so especially these rice only fields can be really helpful for them. Uh, crawfish is usually uh, produced on a two year cycle, so uh, they'll be harvested in they'll be uh, seeded uh, within the field or the rice field in May, and then. Uh, water will be kept on the field uh, for a whole year and then they'll be harvested uh, in May and then the water will be drawn off the landscape. And like I said, uh, crawfish fields are, uh, when you drain the water, are especially good for, for birds. There's a lot of nutrient buildup that happens throughout that year. Um, and so while it's in production, the crawfish fields, even without uh, abundant vegetation of rice, is usually too deep for water birds. It can be up to three feet, uh, or uh, sorry, too deep for shorebirds. It can be up to three feet. Um, but what uh, our program incentivizes farmers to do is to actually keep that water on the landscape um, past May and into uh, June, uh, July, and maybe even August, and then to release it slowly. Um, that way, the uh, that releasing water, that sh shallow water habitat and those mudflats will be available during that uh, July and August 
um, and early September uh, prime shorebird habitat, uh, prime shorebird migratory habitat area. So uh, you might be asking yourself, what, what can you do? Well, if you live in Louisiana and you own farm or manage land, you can contact me or your local NRCS office uh, to learn more about the Shorebirds of Louisiana Wetlands Initiative. Uh, I'll have my contact information on the last slide, which will stay up for a little while. I'd be happy to, to meet with you or talk to you about how you might be able to create some of this habitat on your own land. Or if you know someone who has land, uh, feel free to, to have them give me a call or send me an email. Uh, if you don't own land, but you're a birder, and this is not just uh, within Louisiana, but uh, anywhere within the Western Hemisphere, uh, you might want to uh, volunteer for the International Shorebird Survey, or ISS. This is a program that uh, is headquartered also in Manomet. Uh, you don't have to be a shorebird expert. You don't have to be the best birder that ever lived. Uh, you need access to the same site year round and uh, to be able to survey uh, at least three times per season. And the survey itself is very easy. It uses uh, the eBird app that if, uh, if you're familiar with birding, you might already be familiar with and you can just submit it right on the app. Um, one of the biggest imp uh, impacts uh, to shorebird science as well as habitat management is we really, in order to do that work, we need to know how many birds are on the habitat. We need to know uh, what kind of habitat we're using. We need to know when they're using it. Um, and Citizen science, like the International Shorebird Survey, uh, can and has been used to do some amazing things for shorebird conservation. And uh, if you're interested in uh, watching some birds a couple times a season, uh, we could really use the help. And then, of course, uh, Manomet is a nonprofit. Um, you can help shorebird populations by uh, becoming a supporting uh, member of our work and donating to Manomet. Uh, if you would like to make an online uh, gift, uh, you can go to manomet.org and be sure to uh, direct your gift to Shorebird Recovery um, or the, the Shorebird work that Manomet does. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, Jason very much for joining us as well as Danielle for hosting. And uh, now, uh, we will open the floor for questions. And uh, this is my, my contact information. Feel free to send me an email afterwards if you have more specific questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Or if you're interested in either ISS or the Shorebird, uh, Shorebirds of Louisiana Wetlands Program. Excellent. Thank you so much, Karis and Jason. Um, I thought that was super fascinating. And it looks like our attendees did too because we have a lot of questions sitting in our queue. Uh, I'm going to start off with, we've had a couple of questions about how weather affects shorebirds, um, specifically how uh, hurricanes that frequently come through Louisiana and other places down south uh, affect shorebirds, and if there was any effect from the recent ice storms on shorebirds. You want to take the I first? think if there was, sorry, yes, I think ahead. if there was an effect of the ice storms, um, because of a lot of the interior wetlands would have froze. Um, actually, for, for quite an extended time this time, um, we usually get a little bit of freeze, but, but not like we did this, this, last, uh, uh, this last big cold snap. But it probably pushed them closer to the coast. Um, those habitats don't freeze as, uh, as early or as much, or at all, especially if you get into the, the more saline type marshes. So that, that was very likely what happened with those, with those birds. As far as hurricanes go, I, I don't think they have an, 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 uh, an immediate impact in a given year, maybe long term, it, if they change the amount or the quality of habitat in a specific area, they might shift um, bird densities kind of out of, out of or into. Uh, sometimes they can have some beneficial impacts for shorebirds. Um, I just want to add to that really quick. This past year, we had a really active hurricane season. And there was some impact uh, on managed lands for shorebirds, um, depending on how they're able to manage those water levels. Uh, some, some of those uh, impounded wetlands or agricultural lands uh, had too much water 
after a couple of the larger hurricanes and couldn't um, uh, weren't weren't able to drain it low enough for the that habitat to be open to shorebirds, um, as well as obviously you know uh, damage to crops, damage to the infrastructure um, can have a big impact on uh, whether or not individuals, uh, producers, landowners, as well as uh, organizations and and public lands uh, can can perform the management that they would like to do for shorebirds. Excellent. Um, so what is the impact of hunting on shorebird populations? Are there shorebirds that are hunted uh, specifically in Louisiana? Louisiana is actually a, a very big um, state for two species of shorebirds that are hunted, uh, Wilson snipe and woodcock. Woodcock's an upland kind of forest type bird. Um, so not really using the same type of habitats that we're talking about, um, but snipe will, and uh, they're, they're fairly common. Um, I think Texas and Texas and Louisiana um, are, are wintering areas for, for a large, pop, uh, large portion of the population, um, North American population of snipe. Um, there, as, as far as hunt, other hunting and their effects on shorebirds, typically duck hunting is going to be done on some deeper water. Um, although there, there are some conflicts um, probably in, in, along the margins of wetlands, but um, uh, and you, uh, obviously they're, they're, they're going to be um, excluded from those areas uh, or, or avoid those areas where hunting is taking place. Excellent. Um, and so I have a question from somebody who's obviously uh, local to you all down in Louisiana. How will the plan mid-Breton and mid-Barataria sediment diversions impact shorebird, shorebird habitat? And perhaps for the rest of us, maybe if you could give us a, a little bit of a background on, on what the question is about, that would be helpful. I'll, I'll take that one too. The, usually, <laughs> sed, so, or so a river sedimentation or a diversion project is where you, you cut into the main bank of a river so that that sediment, rather than going all the way out to the, the terminal end, the mouth of the river, and in the case of the Mississippi River, at the mouth of the Mississippi, that you get into the deep part of the ocean. Um, further west you go in Louisiana, it's a lot shallower, the ocean at the, at the end. So like, like the Atchafalaya that I spoke about, shallow water um, uh, at, at the end of the Atchafalaya. So that, so that sediment is actually building up right there. Um, so with a diversion, you're taking water from, um, from a river and diverting it onto a, a, shallow, a shallower flat. Um, so typically that's going to increase, in the short term, it's gonna increase shorebird habitat. It just depends on how long that that, that flow continues. So immediately it's gonna create a mud flat, it'll be used by shorebirds. Over time, that mud flat maybe builds up a little more, it gets vegetated and then kind of excluded. But if there's still sediment going on through that channel, it'll be, it'll be um, settling out a little further down, down river. So um, it, it just depends on the, the scale uh, of time that you're looking at. Yeah, and even once, once that, that uh, coastal marsh that, that, that's hoping to build uh, becomes more vegetated, then it'll it'll have the similar tidal effects uh, and uh, north wind exposure to of mud flats and little ponds within the uh, the vegetated areas that Jason was talking about shorebirds using uh, in other coastal marsh areas. So, in I think both in the short term and in the long term, it'll probably be uh, pretty positive for shorebirds. Great. So um, are the individual shorebirds philopatric in the fall and spring year after year, returning to the same stopover season after season? How does this vary species to species? And does knowing this make it easier to identify which habitats um, to protect? Yeah, um, they, are, they are pretty phil philopatric. Uh, I'm not sure that they uh, necessarily, uh, it depends on the species. Um, but we have seen uh, with the, the tagged wimbrel, for example, that some of the stopover sites, um, they will use very, very similar areas year after year. Uh, although they are, of course, a little bit opportunistic, um, you know, being that they, that they are flying overhead, they are able to see um, 
you know, if they, if they, they can see large areas of open water or mud flat from the, from the sky and, and will uh, find those areas, which is, is part of how uh, providing new habitat in areas where we know shorebirds already frequent um, uh, is able to have such an immediate effect. Um, and so, yeah, and, and like I was talking about with the Wimbrel, identifying those, those resource patches, the, the areas that they, um, that they really use for uh, feeding and the areas they use for roosting is crucial uh, in terms of uh, creating within sites, uh, performing management activities, uh, knowing, knowing where, they, where they're going to be and when um, obviously there are differences in different species and year to year, um, but that, that is absolutely crucial to, to protecting those, those sites and making sure that they have the habitat they need. Excellent. And uh, could you walk us through the the timeline, the yearly timeline of a shorebird again? How long are they spending up north before they're coming down and stopping over in Louisiana? How long do, are they spending um, stopping over before heading off? Uh, yeah, I can actually uh, go back to that phenology slide. Um, it's a little bit easier to see it. Um, actually, that's going to be way too far back, I think. I, I'll, I'll, I'll get there. Um, but uh, usually they're spending, um, it depends on the species. Again, there are, uh, I, I mentioned this briefly, but there are several different kinds of migration strategies. Uh, we call them a uh, hop, skip, and jump. Um, <laughs> and so uh, a hopper will, um, uh, you know, make short flights uh, with frequent stops. A jumper will make uh, longer flights with less frequent stops. Or a, a, sorry, a skipper will, will make uh, slightly longer flights with less frequent stops. And then a jumper will make huge flights and stop very infrequently. And so that is a big difference uh, among different species. Um, and so depending on, you know, how long they've been flying, how much they need to refuel, um, they, they might need to stay in a certain area for, for longer, but uh, about um, 10 days uh, or, or, or two weeks is, is sort of the most um, that we would expect. Um, and so they are, uh, the difference is part of the reason that that fall migration period is so long from July to November is that uh, different species migrate at very different times. And so, and as well as there are some in, some differences um, within the species. Uh, frequently, the young of the year, the birds that have just been born uh, in the Arctic, will stay there for longer and will migrate. The, the adults will migrate early, and then the the chicks will will stay in the Arctic for uh, up to a month or so longer, and then they'll they'll migrate down afterwards, um, which really kind of prolongs that fall migration. And so. If you are only focusing on one species, you can you can get pretty um, a, a, a lot more drilled down on exactly when they'll be doing what. But they usually um, stay in the Arctic uh, for June, July. Um, it's actually not not too too long that they're that they're up there breeding, um, and then they'll be wintering uh, on their wintering grounds from November to February, and then migration. Uh, Timing and distance of migration really, uh, uh, timing and the amount of time that they spend at each stopover site really depends on their strategy as well as their timing and how far they're migrating. Excellent. Thank you for providing that extra detail. I think we have time for one last question today, um, and it's about the dead zone area in the Mississippi River Delta. And does that have any effect on shorebirds? Jason, do you have any experience with that? So, so yeah, the dead zone is kind of, I, I think that's, that more applies to the aquatic or marine um, uh, species and individuals out there. Um, we don't, it, it, to, to answer the question of whether we know whether it affects shorebirds or not, we, we, we have no idea. Um, yeah. You know, because they're they're not swimming out in the open ocean, they're using the the uh, mud flats and the the splays at the end of the Mississippi River. Um, 
you know, there, there still are large numbers of shorebirds out there on those mud flats. So, I mean, it, it, it's hard to say whether they've long-term been affected by that. If they are, it would be the invertebrate base being, uh, being in decline because of pesticides or, or chemicals that are, that are flowing out that river mouth. Awesome. Well, um, thank you, Karis and Jason, and thank you everybody today for bringing your questions and taking part in our conversation. I know that many of you are longtime supporters of Minima, and I wanted to say thank you. We are very grateful for your generosity and commitment to our work. I hope that we'll see you again on another uh, webinar soon. Please keep an eye on your inbox and we'll let you know about any upcoming events. Thank you again and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.